Hello, everybody. Howdy. I've decided to do a quick response to a guy called Godless Cranium. Your idea of a quick response video is a hell of a lot different than mine. And seriously, man, is that your thumbnail? That has got to be one of the laziest thumbnails I have ever seen. It's literally just a screenshot of my introduction video with your avatar's face stuck on top. I mean, I'm not the best at thumbnails, but at least put in some effort. Anyhow, what do you have to say? Now, I'm not going to edit in the video because it's a specific question that he's requested to be answered by Christian and, well, religious YouTubers, people who want to defend Christianity in some manner. And basically because it's a two and a half minute long video and there's only really two questions there, and he basically uses the rest to set up ground rules, I'm just going to leave that out and link it in the description for you. So anyway, the crux of what he's asking is, first of all, why do we need Christianity to sustain Western civilization, first of all? And secondly... Why does atheism destroy Western civilization, which is often a viewpoint expressed by Christians and people of other religions? You may have wanted to include my original question in your video, because you're already off to a horrendous start. My question, and it was a singular question by the way, was what beneficial aspects of religion can't be replaced by secular means? I then laid out two basic ground rules, which were to offer specific examples of something that can't be replaced by secular means, and that you explain your position in your own words, because just quoting books or throwing out names doesn't help me or the people watching our videos understand your position. People aren't going to run out and buy the book, and I find many theists just rattle off names as if that means I should accept their position. In other words, they're appealing to authority. Now, considering you can't even accurately portray my original question, I doubt that you'll be able or willing to answer it. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Let's hear what you got. Okay, so I skipped the first part of his video because he kind of rambles and talks about why atheism ruins societies. I might address this in the future, but it has nothing to do with my question, and I'm not even sure why he bothered to include it. He also talks a bit about morality, which I addressed in my previous video to Snake is Ninja. I'll leave a link to that video in the description box. But I will address a few of Meridian's main points, and I might have messed his name up if I did, I'm sorry. Uh, because he did take the time to make the video, and I feel he deserves some sort of response. Like always, I'll leave a link in the description box to his video, and you can check it out for yourself if you want to check out the original video in its entirety. Moving on. So, you can't really run a society on hedonism, because hedonism is merely seeking sensual pleasure and material pleasure, and it's probably very similar with Randian objectivism, since it doesn't really concede a immaterial either, so it's basically just pursuing material happiness and pursuing sensual pleasure. There's more than just material pleasure. In fact, I actively try not to be materialistic, because I find that material things tie you down. You can be controlled by your things if they're used against you. I can't think of anything I own that I couldn't say goodbye to tomorrow. Now, I'm not saying I'd be jumping for joy if I lost my PS4, or my car, or what have you, but I have lost those things before. I've had people try to control my actions or demand my affection by using my stuff against me. I just won't have it. My freedom of thought and freedom to choose my own path through life are two of the most important concepts in my world. I've also turned down higher paying jobs, significantly higher I might add, than the one I currently hold. I've been offered jobs in factories where the amount they get taken off in taxes is more than my net pay. I've had them tell me I'm crazy for turning them down and partners who were angry with my decision, but I know me. I know that a life doing a repetitive task would slowly kill me from the inside out. Instead, I chose to go into the social services, because I wanted to help people. I wanted a job where I could go home and think to myself, that was a good day's work and I hopefully had a positive impact on another person's life. I didn't do it because I'm chasing some sort of afterlife or because I think some immaterial being will approve, but because that's the kind of job that makes me happy. It's what I love to do. It also offers me the opportunity to continually upgrade my skills and do new and exciting things. When you're dealing with people, no two days are exactly the same. And yes, most of us make choices that will maximize our pleasure and minimize our pain. Likely even you do this, Meridian. But that isn't everything. We will sometimes suffer to achieve a goal. Life will throw us pain and we will overcome it by seeing the bright side or by convincing ourselves that it isn't so bad. We will feel good when we overcome that challenge and we will often rise above it. Material things aren't the only thing that matter and not all atheists just chase material wealth. I think you oversimplify people. Which does a number of things. First of all, it sort of, it sort of disincentivizes the study of ideas and really anything that doesn't lead to material or 
sensual pleasure. Oh, here come the what a load of crap. I love exploring new ideas. That's partially why I run this channel. It's why I read. It's why I watch documentaries. It's why I enjoy talking to people about complex subjects. It, it kind of kills that spirit which people have to kind of sacrifice because if you if you are just in the world to pursue sensual pleasure then what's your need to die for a cause why would you die for a cause and that's one of the things that drives western civilization forward and keeps things going people sacrificing themselves for the overarching system i would say without that the civilization collapses every atheist soldier who has or is willing to die for a cause refutes you every single one i also just explained one of the things that motivates me and I'd be willing to risk my life to protect my freedom of thought and movement, because life without those things isn't a life I'd want to live. I'd also fight to preserve the right for myself and future generations. You don't need belief in a deity for any of this. Some things must be done to sustain society which are neither satisfactory or incur sensual pleasure or, happy or happiness, as, you said, as I've just said. For instance, I doubt that there are nearly enough people who enjoy sorting tax documents 8 hours a day for 50 years. But if we purely followed that hedonistic kind of morality or that Randian objectivist morality, why why would anyone do that? Some people do enjoy that type of work. Other people will do it because that's how they make money and they need money to survive. Do you think these people are doing it because they believe in God? Could they maybe have families to support and dreams to fulfill? My God, man, why are we even having this conversation right now? How does any of this have to do with my original question? I have to skip ahead. <laughs> You're driving me crazy. As for the laws of logic, as I set out, it's kind of a little bit difficult because I'm sure that many people will be like, what? You can't have the laws of logic without immaterialism? That's exactly what I'm thinking. And so allow me to clarify why the laws of logic kind of require an immaterial. There is no physical point in the universe where we can point to the laws of logic. Yet we know that the laws of logic are objective. No, they're a way of thinking to advance knowledge. We agree on their use because they work. If someone wants to assert that there's a round square, for example, it's safe to say that we aren't going to be able to have a constructive conversation. If I say there's going to be a battle tomorrow on that hill, and simultaneously no battle on that same hill, then I'm being illogical. You and I can agree on that because we subjectively agree on that conclusion based on the objective evidence, and how we use language to communicate that objective reality. None of this is predicated on an immaterial being existing. It's based on our brain and how we communicate and understand the world around us. Because Kurt Gödel proved the universality of the laws of logic in his works on baseless axioms regarding mathematics. Since I find math extremely boring, I've asked Inane Dragon to address this portion, and he has kindly agreed. He has a good channel, so please check him out. Take it away, Inane. Thank you, JC, for having me on to talk about this bit on Gödel. I'll try and keep this brief, but I have to be honest, I had never heard of this argument for the immaterial before now. Once I started the research, I think I figured out why. It's because it pretty clearly is not as simple and applicable as Marty claims it to be. I'm neither a mathematician nor a philosopher, so I'll be sticking to the high level and the obvious problems. And I'm going to start with the single most obvious issue. There is no generally accepted claim that Gödel's incompleteness theorems prove the laws of logic to be objectively true. There is not even a significant claim. The closest to any such claim included in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on the theorems is a conjecture, presented without any proof. This conjecture states that either the human mind cannot be replicated by any finite machine, or there are certain mathematical problems called diophantine problems that have no solution expressible as integers. If the former statement were to be true, then human minds would necessarily surpass any mechanistic description of the world requiring either quantum indeterminacy or an immaterial substance to explain its capabilities. If the latter statement turns out to be true, then Gödel insists that mathematical objects and facts exist in an objective and independent sense relative to our minds. He does not, to my knowledge, explain why this should be true rather than asserting it as true. 
Since the conjecture has not been proven to be true and the claimed assertion regarding the second fork of the dilemma has not been supported by any evidence or proof, the whole thing may be dismissed until Marty can present a more formal version of the argument instead of just saying that Gödel has proven the incompleteness theorems prove the laws of logic exist objectively. Never mind this for the moment, what even are we talking about since Marty just dumped us out to a video instead of explaining his argument? Gödel's incompleteness theorem is a pair of theorems in mathematics. The first theorem is where the argument against materialism seems to come from, and it states that any consistent formal system within which a certain amount of elementary arithmetic can be carried out is incomplete, meaning that there are statements formed in the language of that system which can neither be proved nor disproved by the system. In other words, human mathematics is not perfectly capable of solving all problems. Which should surprise no one. We have limited knowledge. Even in principle we couldn't know everything about anything really, but Let's get some terms out of the way. A formal system in mathematics is a finite or algorithmically definable set of axioms and rules of inference that allows you to generate new theorems and solve problems within the limits of those axioms. Such a system is consistent when you cannot make a statement which can be proven both true and false within the system. And these systems are complete if every statement that can be made within the system can either be proven or disproven. Taken out of the formal language, the first theorem roughly states that for any set of axioms and rules of inference which is not internally contradictory will contain statements that cannot be proven or disproven by the system. These statements are often called Gödelian statements. And from this, some mathematicians and philosophers argue that you can make any Gödelian statement into a new axiom of that formal system, since it doesn't contradict it and isn't contradicted by any other axiom of the system. Axioms are considered true by definition, ipso facto you have proven the statement to be true. I can only presume, since Marty doesn't actually present his argument, that this is what he means by Gödel proving the laws of logic to be objectively true, which runs into a wall of problems. First of all, there is a category error with the whole thing. Gödel's incompleteness theorem is strictly limited to formal mathematical systems. The universe, reality, whatever you want to call it, is not reducible to a formal mathematical system. Whether or not you want to believe in platonic forms or Aristotelian potencies or anything else, formal mathematical systems are expressions of human language premised on axioms developed by human minds and expressed in human language. Nothing proven about formal mathematical systems can be transferred to the universe at large. Second, there are limits to Gödel's incompleteness theorem even within mathematics. Alfred Tarski proved the theory of real closed fields to be a complete consistent formal system. He did the same thing for the first order theory of Euclidean geometry. So that's two consistent formal systems of math that demonstrate real limits to Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So you cannot generalize the theorem to any larger set. You have to prove it to apply to each formal mathematical system. And for the third point that I'd like to make on this, it should be obvious to anyone. Axioms are assumed to be true, not proven to be true. Better yet, the laws of logic are already axioms of all formal systems of mathematics. Therefore, Gödel's incompleteness theorem cannot be used to define them into existence because they're already there. As I said at the outset, I'm neither a mathematician nor a philosopher. As such, I may be wrong about my conclusions here. However, when I can do a quick search through a standard reference publication in the relevant field, in this case the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, that implies that an argument is wrong, you should do more than just state, so and so prove this to be true. Make the argument, lay out the premises, define the necessary terms, and demonstrate why we should accept the conclusion. Because a rank amateur found four separate problems with this, 
two of which were explicitly identified within the basic entry-level reference text on this subject. And in reading that reference text, I should note that there are many professional philosophers and mathematicians citing as finding numerous flaws in any argument made to extend the incompleteness theorem beyond its limited applicability in mathematics. You should read those first before ever making any argument about God or materialism from Gödel's incompleteness theorem, because if you don't address those first, you can't even be wrong. Marty, thank you for introducing me to an interesting and important theorem of mathematics, but please make your argument, instead of asserting it to be proven by a famous mathematician. Or at least link to the proof, since the video that you linked makes no such claim about the incompleteness theorem. As presented in your video, it's merely an appeal to authority. And JC, thanks for having me on. This was a little on the insane side of things, though. I'ma get you. You see? Like, you don't have any sort of free will. And at the very least, this leads to the destruction of Western legal systems, because Western legal systems are predicated on moral responsibility fundamentally, and free will is a, is a prerequisite to moral responsibility. I mean, that's why we have things like not guilty on, by reason of insanity. That's outside of moral responsibility for that person, because they're batshit. But the thing is, is that if we remove free will and we remove moral responsibility, that just means everyone's guilty by, by, the, by reason of determinism. Personally, I don't believe in free will, but I do believe in punishment because punishment also helps determine behavior. The threat of punishment acts as a deterrent in some cases and prevents people from acting out certain behaviors. Second, while accepting determinism or no free will, this might lead to a softening of our penal system, but again, I see no reason to do away with it completely. There would still be room for punitive measures, but we could increase our focus on rehabilitation. Third, even if you wanted to think of us like complex biological machines, that wouldn't stop the majority of biological machines from segregating the few that are in effect, not functioning properly, and endangering the lives of the rest. This is essentially what we're doing now when you put someone in jail. Why would this change? I don't think that it would, nor do I think it should, unless we could come up with a more effective alternative. But again, none of this has anything to do with my initial question, and just because you don't like the consequences of something doesn't make it true. Just because you think determinism will lead to the collapse of our legal system, and I certainly don't share in that concern, doesn't mean determinism isn't true. Doesn't it? And ultimately, this is kind of a thing to finish off this first part, isn't, the, isn't judging the benefits of Christianity and judging the benefits of atheism ultimately predicated on an immaterial abstraction in itself. You can't point to that, the, like the, the definition of benef uh, benefit, because benefit is a word that we think of which reflects an immaterial idea. I didn't ask you to name something you think I'll find beneficial. I asked you to tell me what you think is beneficial about religion that can't be replaced by the secular. So far, you've done an abysmal job of carrying this out. So why do we need Christianity to sustain Western civilization? Well, that's because almost all of our institutions are predicated either directly on Nicene Christianity, things like state churches, a lot of law in Europe, at least in the parts of Europe untouched by the French Revolution. Okay, so even if I granted your assertion that these institutions are predicated on Christianity, which I don't because I think many of them are based on secularism, but just for the sake of argument, you fail once again to meet the challenge, because I asked for specifics. Institution, though, isn't a specific benefit or reason or anything. Also, pointing out how something was predicated on something doesn't mean it couldn't function just as well or better using secular models or means. You're basically appealing to tradition, and even if some of these Christian ideals are good ideas, we can use them without keeping the supernatural nonsense that surrounds Christianity. Next. I think we should first of all start by going through the problems with if we can call social justice or sec or something like that secular religion, I think we should start by going through that. Most of those uh, social justice cults and things like that are predicated on Rousseauian ideas. Let me stop you there. You've gone way off track. Being a Christian certainly doesn't mean you can't be a social justice warrior, and being an atheist certainly doesn't mean you will be. In fact, most of the older atheist channels here on YouTube are now anti-SJW channels. 
I also don't much like the label. I think it's used to hand wave away anyone who might have legitimate concerns about social issues, and conflates them with far left-wing ideologues, who I don't think make up the majority of liberals or the left. It's like me calling all conservatives alt-righters or Nazis, because some far-right ideologues are conservatives. I prefer to find out what people believe on an individual level, rather than smack around labels. This again doesn't answer my question. Next. We have a lot of problems with Islam. I'm sure that many of you atheists watching will be aware that Islam is bad for a number of reasons, but the specific reason I'm going to oppose it is because it lacks a Logos. Allah is a Logos, logo lost God. Okay, I agree that Islam is a problem. I don't think it's true. I don't think your religion is true either. I don't see a reason to prop up one religion to combat another. I prefer to say they're both not true, they both distort how we perceive reality, and both lead to horrendous consequences to varying degrees. Again, this has nothing to do with my question. Next. Right, now let's go on to polytheisms. Uh, let's not. Polytheisms are garbage. They aren't true either, and discussing them doesn't answer my question in any way. Next. So anyway, that's just a quick kind of rant thing. Good talk. <laughs> I think you failed miserably at answering my question. You did a lot of talking, but none of it really had to do with my initial challenge. However, I do thank you for taking the time to make a response, and I thank you very much for your kind words about my upcoming wedding. Much appreciated. That's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching, take care, and cheers.